So by popular demand, I am going to address the coming wave of robotics. Now, I haven't talked about this too much uh, up to this point because there was not as much commercial hype building. But after the Unitree demos, after the Boston Atlas 2 demos, and after the Figure 2 demos, uh, I think it's safe to say that it is high time to talk about the coming robotics wave. So, uh, as I mentioned, there, are, there have been a few demonstrations. Uh, the primary competitors seem to be Unitree, Figure, Tesla, and Boston Dynamics, just to name uh, the top ones. Now, of course, there are plenty of other people working on uh, similar robots, including IBM, Amazon, Toyota, and a few others, uh, Honda, um, but none seem quite as far along in integration as these guys are. So what are like what are the kind of the high level facts and figures? Originally, some of these robots are priced north of two hundred thousand dollars, with the more recent iterations getting as low as eight thousand or sorry eighty thousand dollars. And finally, a lot of these companies are aiming for the kind of golden uh, ten thousand uh, dollar humanoid robot. Um, and these are not just, you know, robots that can move uh, stiffly. If you've watched some of the demos, these are robots that have a pretty high degree of agility and manual de dexterity. Uh, in many cases, surpassing that of human agility and dexterity. Uh, not every case, and certainly that doesn't mean that they're going to be able to, you know, tear your engine apart and, you know, fix your car or, or build a house just yet. But the fact that they're not even commercially available yet and they're as good as they are... We are only at the beginning. It's only going to get better from here. So let's talk about kind of uh, what I expect to see, kind of the, the, mo the next milestones, as well as some of the, the legal and economic concerns. So first and foremost, total cost of ownership. This is a really important un uh, kind of uh, concept to understand. So in the tech space, there is, a, or business space more broadly rather, there is this concept called, called total cost of ownership, which is uh, that is the, the net cost of how much you will spend in order to own a product or to use a service. Now, let's just take your car, for example. Your car has the purchase price, um, the insurance, the fuel, the maintenance, and any other ancillary uh, expenses that come with it. So the total cost of ownership for your car is not just the price tag, it's everything else that comes with it. Now, in the case of robots, there is the initial price tag, then there's the energy that it uses, then there's the maintenance and upkeep, and then there's also the possibility of needing uh, subscription services for software updates and that sort of thing. Now, to be fair, based on the polls that I've seen out there, people would prefer to just buy a robot and then not have any subscription. My Garmin, actually, the company Garmin doesn't do subscriptions for that very reason. Their devices are more expensive, um, but they're higher quality and there's no subscription to worry about. So the TCO for this is the initial purchase price and however much it costs to charge, um, which is a very different uh, business model from the subscription service model. But I just wanted to point all that out. Now, a lot of these numbers are kind of educated guesses so far because we don't have wide scale adoption of these robots. Now, some of these numbers are guesstimates and uh, so take it with a grain of salt, but the uh, maintenance costs for these robots are being estimated to kind of land somewhere between $1,000 a year and $10,000 a year. Now, that will vary drastically depending on the use case of the robot. So, for instance, if you have a warehouse robot or a delivery robot that is, you know, walking tens of miles a day, the maintenance costs are probably going to be much higher um, than a robot that is meant for domestic assistance and doing soft work like, you know, folding laundry and cooking for you. Um, there is also likely to be a broad distribution of types of robots. Um, so robots that are heavier more for more industrial use, robots that are smaller for more entertainment uses, those sorts of things. So again, we don't have the numbers yet because they haven't been deployed. Um, so right now we're just kind of guessing. Now let's talk about the job roles because this is really kind of the core question that a lot of you have asked, which is what is going to happen? We can talk about artificial intelligence impact on jobs, uh, but robots are going to have a fundamentally different impact, even if they're powered by artificial intelligence. You could even think of these as a separate class because there's a hardware stack um, and the affordances of creating a machine that can operate in the same physical space as you and I has just very different constraints and different affordances than a purely digital artificial intelligence. You know, if you have AGI via that you can access on the internet via API, that's still different than a robot that can do the same things as a human can do or better. 
So the first thing is going to be low skill jobs. Um, you, we're already seeing uh, warehouse uh, work being done by some people. I think Elon has said that uh, that they're already deploying Optimus in the Tesla Gigafactories. So warehouse workers, dock workers, janitors, sweepers, you know, cleaners, those sorts of things are going to be pretty optimal for these robots. We already have Roombas, basically. Um, so just imagine a bigger, smarter Roomba that is able to do more and use more tools. Um, healthcare roles is an interesting possibility. Now, Japan has had population issues for a long time, and they've also had demographic issues for a long time. And so Japan is actually much further ahead of us with using nurse robots that are basically there to deliver medications. But imagine that those nurse robots are actually a little bit smarter, or actually a lot smarter than they have been, and are able to have conversations with patients, keep them company, that sort of thing. There was actually um, someone that I almost interviewed a couple years ago um, who was using early language models. She was studying them as basically creating uh, more interactive at-home smart devices for conversation. And one of the goals was to keep um, either special needs people uh, or elderly people company. So some of the tests were done with, um, you know, here's, here's a person, here's a senior citizen in a care home and have them, you know, basically give them a digital companion. And in other cases, uh, it was for autistic children. Um, so autistic children often find it easier to converse with a machine than a human. Um, and so imagine those are some other use cases that might be relatively eminently doable. Um, maybe maybe even not even for a full-size uh, humanoid robot, but you know, a half-size or a hobbit-sized humanoid robot might be ideal for a, for a child's companion or a senior citizen's companion, especially if it's not there to do anything uh, such as heavy lifting. Now, commercial use and industrial use is going to be a little bit harder um, just because those robots are going to be more expensive because they're going to have to be more robust. And also, if they're handling expensive materials or high-risk environments, OSHA is going to have something to say about that, and we'll talk about the regulatory hurdles in just a second. Now, before we even get to the regula regulatory hurdles in terms of liability, we also need to talk about licensure. So a lot of people say, ah, well, you know, I'll, you know, the robot's never going to be able to replace me as a truck driver or a welder or a carpenter or an electrician or a plumber. And there is a good reason for that argument, at least for the foreseeable future. And the number one reason is because all of those jobs require special licensure. And if you are not a human, you can't get the license. And so because of that, we just do not have the precedent. We don't have the jurisprudence to even understand how to approach this problem. Um, now, I'm not a lawyer, so I could be completely wrong about that. There might already be some regulatory frameworks for having machines doing high-risk work um, in lieu of humans, but I'm not really aware of it, particularly when it's going to be a comparable one-to-one -one replacement where basically you have a robotic construction worker that replaces a human construction worker. Again, I have no idea how the liability of, on that works, and I have no idea how the licensure would work on that. Maybe you still need a human to double check the work if they're doing electrical work. I don't know. Um, so yeah, that, that's, the, that's the biggest unknown for me right now. One thing that I will say though, is that because these machines are likely to be far more cost efficient than humans, there will be tremendous pressure from companies to say, create some framework for us so that we can use these damn things. <laughs> I can just imagine every construction worker out there, every factory owner out there. I mean, I think Elon Musk will probably be one of the primary, you know, uh, lobbyists for this because he's building some of the robots. So he wants to use, he wants to maximize his own internal resources. Um, so because of that, I have some degree of confidence that at least once these, com once these robots are commercially ready, then we will probably get some traction um, however, labor unions and other lobbyists are going to fight it tooth and nail. And I wouldn't be surprised, particularly uh, higher end professional services like doctors and lawyers. I would not be surprised if they succeed in getting laws put in place that ban robots indefinitely, which I think would be really awful for our economic future, um, particularly because there's, it, it's entirely possible that robotic doctors and robotic lawyers might be better than humans. Um, so yeah, we'll see how that plays out. Um, one model that you might be wondering is, okay, what is life going to be like? And I, I honestly think that looking at um, the way that droids are portrayed in Star Wars, particularly some of the expanded universe um, books and video games, where they're just kind of everywhere, um, is probably how it's going to be like in 10 to 20 years, maybe even less than that. Um, you know, they can be doing everything from domestic chores 
Um, you know, imagine you have a domestic servant that is, you're just like, let's imagine that this robot's name is Bobby. And you're like, Bobby, I'm going out. Can you cook dinner while I'm, you know, going to pick up the kids? And Bobby would be like, sure, Dave. You know, something like that. You might have delivery robots. Um, so that might replace mail carriers, Amazon drivers, that sort of thing. Um, even if doctors and lawyers and other professionals remain, they'll probably have robotic assistants helping them with their stuff. Imagine that a CEO, instead of a human um, executive assistant, they have a robot executive assistant that is following them around all day. I can completely imagine that happening very soon uh, rather than later. Now, again, high-risk roles such as you know, doctors, surgeons, um, you know, demolition techs, those sorts of things might take a little bit longer to replace. Um, but then again, if it is a high-risk environment where human lives are at risk, you have a moral imperative to get the human out of danger's way. Um, so, and again, I will reiterate economic pressure. Um, as, these, as the price point of these robots comes down and their capabilities go up, there will be increasing demand to replace human labor just in order to remain competitive. Now, speaking of uh, rising demand, probably one of the biggest questions that a lot of you guys have right now is when is this going to happen? We don't really have a model for this. I mean, the two closest models are one, the adoption of the automobile and two, the adoption of smartphones. So from the, from the introduction of the Ford Model T until it basically replaced most horses was about 17 years. Now, from the introduction of the, of the iPhone, which was arguably when the um, smartphone had product market fit, that was 2007. And by 2015, the vast majority of Americans were using smartphones. So that adoption cycle was eight years. Because of economies of scale, we might see a similar adoption curve. Although what I will say is that robots are substantially more expensive than smartphones. Um, and so we might see a slightly slower adoption just because of that, that fact. Where it might be, you know, we went from um, one car uh, per family to a two car family over time as the relative cost of automobiles has not really kept up with inflation. Um, that is a whole other conversation and I might not be completely right about that. But my point is, is that when the automobile was introduced, they were so expensive that only the rich people had them and they only had one. And now they're so abundant that many, many houses have uh, multiple cars. Like you go to a typical suburban neighborhood, every member of the family has a car if they're all teenagers or older. Um, so, but that product market fit is what we're really going to be looking for. Now, because there is so much competition already, I suspect we will find that product market fit within the next year or two. I would be shocked if we don't have robotic product market fit by the end of 2025 or 2026. Um, at the very latest. Now, just because you have product market fit does not mean that they're going to be super cheap. It's a trade-off between cost and capability, but the underlying AI is going to be improving while the hardware is getting cheaper. So we'll see. Um, another uh, thing, and this is kind of what I was referring to is what I call statutory jobs, or not what I call, but what, what is called statutory jobs. So these are jobs that are required to be done by humans by law. So lawyers, politicians, judges, uh, doctors, um, there are lots and lots of jobs out there right now that when the laws were put on the books, it was not contemplated that a non-human entity could do them. Um, and so just because of that, we're probably going to see a lot of inertia kind of slowing down the adoption of some of these things. Um, now with that being said, there is actually a pretty high variance from one culture to another. So for instance, China and Japan are much more amenable to integrating robots into their daily life. This is due in part to the, uh, their technological ethos, um, also their, the fiction that they tell. I mean, Japan has been making robot stories for, I think, since the 50s was the earliest robot anime. Um, so they have at least five decades, if not six decades, of robot stories making them more comfortable with robots. Whereas humans still, or uh, not humans, <laughs> Japanese are humans too, Americans... <laughs> that was quite the spoonerism split slip of the tongue. While Americans uh, are a little bit more squicked out by uh, robots, you know, kind of invading our spaces. But at the same time, we tend to sexualize them and fantasize them and see, see Westworld. So who knows where to land with humans. And also, I remember running that poll. 60% of the people in my audience are already horny for robots. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe America will adopt robots really fast, too. Um, finally... I do anticipate we might have a slow-ish rollout because of some of these factors. Number one, the regulatory hurdles. Who's liable if the robot drops a baby? Who's liable if the robot burns down your house? 
who's liable if the robot, you know, accidentally burns down a construction site, those sorts of things. It mostly comes down to liability and license licensure. Um, once we figure out those two things, that will be one major hurdle. Um, the product market fit and the price market fit is going to be another hurdle where basically the capability of the robot has to be good enough to justify the cost, whatever that cost is. Um, and as I already mentioned, the underlying AI is easier to adopt because we already live in an internet digital world. Um, and one of the reasons that a lot of companies are banking on humanoid robots is because the affordances of the world that we live in are already favoring humans. All the to uh, toys, all the tools that we use and the toys, I guess, for that matter, um, the cars that we drive, uh, the buildings that we build, they're all shaped for human use. So it makes sense to build a robotic, uh, a humanoid robot in order to occupy the same space and do the same jobs as us. We can build octopus robots. We can build eight armed robots. Um, but evolution has created our form factor and it's pretty efficient. There are things wrong with our form factor. If you were to design it from scratch, there are a few things that you might do differently. But at the same time, we're pretty functional. We were able to build the world with just our own hands and feet up until this point. Um, and then finally, um, this will compound the need for post-labor economics. Because it's one thing if artificial general intelligence is invented, but it only lives in a data center. Because right now, that's where, that's where AI models live. They're not really deployed broadly. Now, um, we will see more and more AI models deployed to edge devices, such as your home computer, smart home devices, your smartphone, your car, and that sort of thing. But the most powerful AGI is going to be in data centers just because that's where all the compute is. At the same time, you could put a pretty beefy processor in a human-sized robot. Um, and when you do that, you're going to have even more distributed uh, intelligence. I don't know if it'll quite qualify as general intelligence. It might. But then you can also have them offload some of their cognition up to the cloud. Uh, so anyways, this will almost certainly uh, continue to disrupt the economic paradigms that we have. And honestly, this might disrupt uh, blue-collar labor and semi-skilled labor far faster than anyone could anticipate. Because again, once you, once you have one robot that can do it, you can mass-produce them. And you go from zero to a million uh, robot laborers within a year or two, as it, depending on how long it takes them to build. Obviously, the first year, they're probably going to build, you know, 1,000 units, 10,000 units. The second year might be 100,000 units. Third year, it could be a million units. Um, we, could we could see a ramp up of this very quickly um, if, there, if the product market fit is there, if the price is justified. So with all that being said, thanks for watching. I hope you're as excited about robots as I am. Um, yeah, this could happen quick.